this story could not be real. You, if you were making a film, someone would say, okay, that's too... No, no it's not possible, it's not, it's not real, it's not possible. Make it real. I have no inconvenience in saying and explaining what really happened. And if I have to go to jail because I have said something which I should not say, someone tell me. And I went at home and I say to my wife, this is the end. Wake up to my sons and say, uh, today is the end. The star of case against me and against my wife. I think this is a, a process to make fear I lost everything. I start from zero. Sooner or later, they will try to indict us for whatever. Money laundering, child abuse, uh, drug trafficking, or whatever. They will invent it and they will try it because at the end, it's not a matter of result. It's a matter of destroying the person and with, in that way destroying the line of defense. I agree with the rule of law, and I also agree with the basic terms of uh, democracy, but they don't. So it's quite strange, no, to protect in the name of democracy the heritage of the dictatorship, with no separation of powers, no respect of freedom for the truth. And you never think you never believe that you will be the target of a conspiracy or that you will be in the middle of, of a story like this one. I mean, this is something that you see in the news. People is getting fed up. And we'll get to a point that will explode. Andorra will pay the price, unfortunately. We'll pay the price, the young people especially. That my father wasn't bad that he had a problem because the government sold our country to America. Our story begins in Andorra, a micro country with a landmass of 181 square miles consisting of a couple of valleys in the Pyrenees Mountains landlocked between France and Spain with a total population of less than 80,000 people. You can seat the entire population of Andorra's capital city inside Madison Square Garden. If you've never heard of the country of Andorra until now, you are not alone. It's not uncommon for an Andorran resident entering the United States to be stopped by passport control and questioned under the accusation of carrying a fake passport from a fake country. The quality of life in Andorra is one of the highest in the world. No poverty, no crime, and ranked in the top five safest countries. The source of its healthy GDP comes from 8 million tourists visiting annually for its skiing, duty-free shopping, and its banking system. Andorra first gained its independence in the year 1278. And for the next 700 years, Andorra was ruled by medieval feudal overlords until it finally created an executive, legislative, and judicial branch of government when it first established its constitution in 1993. In Andorra, se da una situación muy uh, paradójica desde hace ya muchos años. Hay que tener en cuenta que el país uh, tiene dos jefes de estado, dos copríncipes. Uno es el presidente de la República Francesa, el otro es el obispo de la Seu de Urgell. Es decir, eh, en la cúspide del poder de Andorra hay una persona nombrada por el Vaticano. Esto durante la Edad Media, durante siglos, era una herencia de los tiempos feudales. While Andorra is the world's only co-principality, its 1993 constitution also added democratically elected presidents. Durante la Segunda Guerra Mundial, hay muchos judíos que huyen 
hacia España de la persecución nazi a través de Andorra. Y se sabe que algunos andorranos asesinaron a judíos que huían para robarles joyas, dinero. Y que de estas joyas, este dinero, es el origen de muchas fortunas de Andorra. Unlike other countries that utilized offshore banking as a haven to hide their stolen wealth during World War II, Andorra's flagship bank was born this way. Offshore banking simply refers to the deposit of funds by a company or individual in a bank that is located outside of their national residence. It's not always a vacation destination like the Cayman Islands, Bermuda, or the British Virgin Islands. Offshore banking is everywhere, with some of the most accessible offshore banking located right inside the United States. The simple fact of opening a bank account offshore doesn't imply that you are doing something wrong. Let's take Argentina. Argentina is a country where approximately every 10 years, some way or another, one way or another, the government steals the money from its population, either by means of inflation, either by means of seizing the money. They, they, find, they find a way, they are very creative for that. So if you're in Argentina, what you do is just to first, to have dollars, not pesos, and second, just to hide your wealth under your mattress if you can, or if you can afford it, just to go somewhere else in the world and store your money there. However, most of the world's Fortune 500 companies store trillions of dollars of their profits offshore to avoid paying taxes. 293 Fortune 500 companies with offshore earnings collectively owe $752 billion in federal taxes. That's $52 billion more than the bank bailout of 2008. Celebrities, businessmen, world leaders, and politicians from both sides of the aisles safely store their wealth in offshore banking to avoid paying taxes by opening up fake shell companies to hide their money. America's IRS is powerless over this, so they audit the poor instead. Given the inherent secrecy and anonymity of shell companies, terrorist funding, drug and human trafficking profits, and all sorts of criminal money laundering is rampant. Every day, open the, open the newspaper and you will see all this news about criminal networks. All that money, most of it is passing through the financial system. And the most a bank can do is just apply certain controls, which are standardized. So in that regard, the banks, the most they can do is just to try to minimize the damage. The problem is that the trend, not in many countries in the last 10 years, from the authorities, the police has been to point to the, to the banks and to the individuals working at those banks and they are making them responsible of what the clients do. You can fight, you can make your best, you can have a very big team, a very, but you cannot avoid money laundering. It's not possible. It's like the poli, poli, you have to avoid criminals and they say, okay, we have a police here. We have the police, we don't have criminals. No, you have the police and you have criminals. You have compliance department and you have money laundering. If a client comes to make a deposit at your bank with a briefcase with one million dollars stained with blood, well, maybe, maybe there are some leading indicators here that may point that something is wrong, but honestly, it's completely uncontrolled. In the wake of the attacks of September the 11th, America introduced the Patriot Act, and within it also introduced something called a Section 311 to promote the prevention, detection, and prosecution of international money laundering and financing of terrorism. Section 311 of the USA Patriot Act grants the director of FinCEN the authority upon finding that reasonable grounds exist for concluding that a foreign jurisdiction, foreign financial institution, class of transactions, or type of account is of primary money laundering concern to require domestic financial institutions and financial agencies to take certain special measures to address the primary money laundering concern. FinCEN may impose one or more of these special measures in order to protect the U.S. financial system from these threats. FinCEN stands for the U.S. Department of Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. 
A Section 311 notice issued by FinCEN consists of nothing more than a standard press release. Section 311 was designed to deal with a very severe problem that could lead to a need for emergency action, and it's being used for anything but. It's a tool, um, and it's being used you know, for other political or regulatory goals, and there's really no, there's no recourse. While the September 11th attacks cost the terrorists a half a million dollars to execute, in 2012, HSBC, an offshore bank originating in Hong Kong, was caught and openly admitted to assisting the Sinaloa drug cartel and terrorist organization in Mexico to launder at least $881 million, enough to pay for 1,762 September 11th attacks. FinCEN never issued a Section 311 against HSBC, and HSBC is still operating business as usual. In 2017, when Denmark's offshore bank Danske Bank was caught and admitted to laundering $230 billion of criminal money for the Russian state, the equivalent of 460,000 September 11th attacks, FinCEN never issued a Section 311 against Danske Bank either. In fact, no large commercial bank of primary money laundering concern has ever had a Section 311 issued against them. Some of the banks are really making a business line out of doing really bad business or their procedures and policies you could drive a truck through. Nobody goes to jail and these banks are so large that they're not going to get shut down. And so what you have is a, um, a situation where only the little guys in the little places where it's not going to cause a disruptive effect system-wide. And so in that sense, the biggest wrongdoers have the most insulation and the, sm the smallest wrongdoers or those that aren't even doing wrong at all are going to be victims without any meaningful redress. And if you look at who has been gone after with Section 311 notices, they are almost always smaller banks in smaller places. To begin, uh, I am Juan Tejudo, I did my studies in Barcelona about the, the economics. I stayed for quite 30 years in La Caixa, which now is Caixa Bank. And finally, I came to Andorra, to Banca Privada de Andorra, BPA, which uh, was a bank who was trying to grow up because uh, I was advertised when I came to Andorra that uh, this country was near to lose its condition of uh, tax haven more sooner than later because uh, of the pressure of Spain and France against tax havens. And uh, in fact, immediately we bought a bank in Spain, which was Banco Madrid. And we had clear from the first moment that our future was in the onshore system, not in the offshore one. It has its days near to close. And then Banco Madrid was the jewel of the crown. And it was a, 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 a history of success until the moment that the bomb came. On March 10th, 2015, the United States Treasury's FinCEN issued a Section 311 press release against BPA. I didn't know who were FinCEN until that moment. <laughs> and the, 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 the three or four persons that were in the room, we didn't know anything about FinCEN. I have no idea what FinCEN was, to be honest. I knew what was FinCEN, but they don't. For me, that was a, a normal day. Uh, so I just walked into the bank, went to, my, to the office. At 12 o'clock, the INAF called me and say, Santi, you have to come to enough to our offices. And then Santi appears. He said, we need to go to the enough. I said, to the enough? I mean, it's a regulator. I mean, you deal with the regulator. I said, we need to go to the enough. Santi, Pablo Laplana, and, and myself. And we stay there, waiting, waiting, waiting. And they didn't explain anything. And we started to, to talk, up, obviously, among us, saying, what's going on? And they said, we have no idea of what's going on. 
nobody tell us, uh, they say that we cannot go out. They didn't allow us to leave, which was quite surprising that enough. Uh, Santi, he said, I, I need to go, he's diabetic, so he said, I need to go out. My, my father is a diabetic person, so he needs his insulin, and my mom told me, I just went to the, to the place where all the people of the bank were. She came, actually, we, I remember, I said to him, do you have a phone charger spare at home? Yes, please bring, because we were running out of batteries with all the messages, because I received other messages from other people saying the word in the street is that the BPA is bankrupt. Uh, other people were, were telling me the bank has liquidity problems. I mean, I said that that's impossible, so I mean, I discarded those. And then we start to look at the internet. The notice is issued, we saw that notice in our cell phones. It surprised us. For me it was incredible, it's like a shock, because they are talking about some things that are not real. Uh, to be honest, the first reaction uh, that we had was of, of we, we relaxed, because we saw what was on the notice, this makes no sense. The, the notice is, is full, full of misrepresentations, I would say, of the, of the actual facts. And also, the, the notice has outdated uh, information. And we were relaxed. I mean, like, okay, we, 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 can, we can handle this. It's not that we have, I don't know, uh, an account from Osama bin Laden and we didn't know about that, that will be a huge problem. So they issued a Section 311 notice. It was under the Patriot Act. There was no suggestion of any terrorism, whatever. Andorra's president, Antoni Marti, immediately appeared on television. Banca Privada d'Andorra, i si tot és talment, entitat sotmesa a preocupació de primer ordre en matèria de blanqueig de capitals. Arran d'aquesta qualificació, les autoritats americanes proposen un seguit de mesures a fi de limitar la capacitat operativa de Banca Privada d'Andorra en el futur. Insisteixo que es tracta d'un cas de presumptes males pràctiques i no d'una situació de risc de solvència o problemes de balanç. They were not simply just an Andorran bank, they were a Spanish bank, so they had to subject all of their policies and procedures to the scrutiny of a European Union regulator, which had to meet all European Union regulations. And they hired top accounting firms to do the work and make sure that they were running it properly and fully in accordance with the Andorran regulatory system, but also with global standards on money laundering. 99% of the world's top 1,000 companies are regularly audited by at least one of the world's top four major accounting firms, KPMG, Deloitte, PricewaterhouseCoopers, and Ernst & Young. Based on the international anti-money laundering regulations established by the United Nations, Article 52, Prevention and Detection of Transfers of Proceeds of Crime, KPMG conducted independent annual anti-money laundering audits of BPA from 2008 to 2012, overlapping with Deloitte, independently auditing BPA in 2007 and 2013 followed by a 2014 audit completed by Andorra's own Financial Intelligence Unit. All three of these independent audits demonstrated zero money laundering activity during the same time frame that America's Section 311 alleges BPA was engaging in money laundering. March 11, 2015, 24 hours after America's Section 311 against BPA, Maria Kosan, the director of ANAF, Andorra's financial regulator, goes on national television, assuring the people of Andorra that everything is fine. In cap cas, el desencadenant d'aquesta intervenció té res a veure amb la situació de solvència i liquiditat de l'entitat. A los clientes, d'entrada, no les tiene que afectar, perquè aquesta és una investigació sobre unes potenciales males pràctiques en prevenció de blanqueo i nada que ver con solvència Meanwhile, while Maria Kosan is speaking to the Andorran people, BPA's small sister branch in Panama is ordered liquidated. BPA Panama's liquidation and audit was headed by Jamie D. Gamboa. In my direct communication with Mr. D. Gamboa, he confirmed his role and confirmed an independent two-year audit, concluding that no money laundering transactions were detected. The following morning, on March 12th, 
48 hours after America's Section 311, the Andorran government and a NAV, headed by Maria Kosan, suddenly contradict everything they had said in the previous 48 hours and ordered all BPA customer accounts frozen, allowing each customer a maximum withdrawal of 2,500 euros per week, causing mass protests in Andorra, with BPA's customers demanding full access to their accounts. The general manager of INA was the auditor from working in KPMG and was the auditor of BPA from 2008 until 2011. And when finished in KPMG, she went to be the general manager of INA. So she was the auditor from all the activity of BPA. Spanish bank, Banco Madrid, has filed for bankruptcy. Customers rush to empty their accounts. BPA's Banco Madrid simultaneously goes bankrupt. In the Spanish media, members of the government uh, went to official TV saying that Banco Madrid was a launderer machine and crimes everywhere. Now, there are uh, sentences on the court at state that there was no laundering at all in Banco Madrid. But the thing is done. The order was to liquidate it. Also on March 12th, the Andorran government and ANAF seize full control of BPA, resulting in the majority of BPA's management fired and sent home until further notice. I remember that every morning I woke up and I told my father, okay, how hard it's gonna be today. So from a scale from 1 to 10, how hard it's going to be today? I say, uh, today is the end. He was, he was fired, but not, not just fired, but he didn't, no, he, was, he wasn't able to work as an economist more. March 13th, 2015, 72 hours after America's Section 311, John Paul Miguel Pratt's BPA CEO is arrested and spends the next two years in prison, which is the maximum time allowed to be held in prison under Andorran law, without the Andorran police requiring any burden of proof that an actual crime has been committed. I never imagined that could happen. In two years? That's not normal. What is there that is allowing them to to arrest him. What do they have? And he ended up that they didn't have anything. March 16th, 2015, six days after America's Section 311, Jordi Sinca, Andorra's Minister of Finance, goes on national television. El supervisor, l'INAF, de manera immediata, va prendre mesures, mesures extraordinàries, inèdites a Andorra i contundents. I de continuar avançant és mantindre la ferma voluntat i el ferm compromís en relació a la transparència, en relació a l'intercanvi d'informació i en relació a tot el que és la prevenció de blanqueig. I aquest compromís està inalterat. Res, res el farà torcer. The infamous Panama Papers leak revealed that Mr. Jordi Sinca, before becoming Andorra's finance minister, was also the owner of an offshore company. This company was in the business of the blood diamond trade. Jordi Sinca held significant shares in an Andorran company called Orfund, a conglomerate dedicated to gold and diamonds. Three subsidiaries of this group operated in Liberia under the bloodthirsty dictator Charles Taylor, who gave tax privileges to one of Orfund's subsidiaries. Charles Taylor is currently sentenced to 50 years in prison for crimes against humanity at a special war crimes court in The Hague. And it was proven in court that the civil war he waged that led to the rape, dismemberment, and murder of countless civilians was financed by the diamond trade. Jordi Sinca was not merely a shareholder. He also actively worked with the Orfund Group. Sinca's name appears on this document, for example, as the sender of 500,000 pesetas to El Haji Fofana, the dictator's right-hand man involved in that civil war, with whom this Andorran company was working with to be able to exploit the blood diamond mines in Liberia. In addition, Jordi Sinca had contact through this company with Fernando Fernandez Rableda, an associate of one of the largest arms dealers in Africa. Sí, vamos a ver, Jordi Finca es un personaje al que yo conozco muy bien, fíjate si le conozco bien, 
que me presentó una querella contra el honor por una información que yo publiqué y por un libro que yo publiqué en la que puse de manifiesto con todo lujo de detalle eh, cómo y de qué manera él estaba implicado en una trama internacional de compra y venta de diamantes y de oro que no pasaba por los controles eh, aduaneros y por los controles legalmente establecidos a través de una empresa que se llamaba Orfun que está en Andorra. Una demanda que naturalmente gané y eh, él perdió y tuvo que pagar todas las costas porque, porque la justicia me dio la razón a mí y habló de un trabajo periodístico impecable el que hicimos en este libro. El libro se llamaba Diamantes sucios. Y, y naturalmente no fue denunciado por su gobierno porque él es el gobierno y no, no fue denuncia, denunciado por la policía ni por la fiscalía porque la fiscalía tiene una dependencia casi orgánica del ejecutivo andorrano. ¿no? Also on March 16th, Jordi Sinca concludes his national address without mentioning that he contracted PricewaterhouseCoopers to begin auditing BPA's alleged money laundering activity. How the government of Andorra manage to know if In BPA, there were a lot of criminals contracting Pricewaterhouse. Pricewaterhouse is an American firm who is one of the big four. And if Pricewaterhouse says it is good, it is good. And if it says it is bad, it is bad. And the United States will accept it because it's Price. I was there when Pricewaterhouse came to, to BPA. I was there and I saw how they work. To your knowledge, have they found anything wrong? No, not at all. Not at all. And nothing bad. Well, this is not possible. Here it must be something wrong. If Vincent says, it is true. Finally, they had to make something unbelievable. They asked me, uh, because at, at first I, I thought they were in good faith, and I was in good faith, They asked me, okay, uh, Isabel, tell, me, tell us which are the complicated customers. The customers, well, if you have to, suspic to make any suspicions of your customers, which will be that customers? And I make a list for them. And the list was um, the list that they say that have the clients that has not passed and nothing else. In other words, after analyzing 15 million transactions spanning seven years of more than 37,000 accounts, PricewaterhouseCoopers found zero evidence of money laundering at BPA. PricewaterhouseCoopers then asks Isabel, BPA's compliance officer, to make a list of possible suspicious accounts, which were immediately placed into the money laundering pile which amounted to 2,165 customers, or 7.4% of BPA's open accounts, amounting to 32.4% of the entire monetary value of deposits of BPA. Um, what happens? The clients passed through a crucifixion. Well, PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, came to Andorra with a lot of young uh, economies, very young, and make a, a back work for me. Uh, there are nothing worse than an incompetence with initiative. In order for PricewaterhouseCoopers to keep their charade alive, they needed to invent reasons for these customers to be categorized as money launderers. They accomplished this by demanding proof of origin for each and every penny deposited in these selected accounts, thus creating an instant demand for Andorra's legal professionals. Pero es, es tan estúpido hasta el punto de que nos han pedido, uh, oiga, este dinero que va al concesionario Ford, ¿De qué es? Dice, de la compra de un coche. Okay. Dice, pues tráigame, por favor, la factura. Dice, es del 2008. Es decir, han llegado a pedir cosas absurdas. Dice, 10 años later, you ask me about when I buy a car. Are you crazy? Or this uh, 500 euros. Uh, what do you do with this? I don't remember. Ah, you are a money lender. If you do not demonstrate the origin of the money is good, you will not get it. Oh, but it belongs to my father, and my father is dead. I don't know how to... Uh. How many account holders you represent? ¿Cuántos clientes? ¿Cuántos clientes tenemos? Más o menos 700, 1,000 clientes, más o menos. About 700 to 1,000. 700 to 1,000, the two of you? Sí, todos nuestros clientes Um, son personas honestas porque nosotras hemos hecho nuestros caicés 
son personas honestas que todo el dinero que, que han invertido en este país ha sido fruto de su trabajo y, y, su, y su procedencia, toda ella es procedencia legal. Hasta lo que nosotros sabemos con toda la documentación que hemos hecho aportar cuando los hemos cogido como clientes. Y, y ellos se encuentran, te, tenemos diferentes, pero el, el, el gran porcentaje de clientes son eh, empresarios, pequeños empresarios, que todos sus ahorros los han depositado aquí para su jubilación. Y cuando ha llegado el momento de la, de la jubilación o a las puertas de la jubilación, se han encontrado pues, que no podían disponer con su recaudo, con su seguro, con, con, con su futuro vital pa, pa, para los próximos años para afrontar pues, una vida no activa, laboralmente hablando. Tenemos clientes que necesitaban el dinero para tratamientos médicos, pero sí que podemos decir mmm, de, del sufrimiento y, y, y impotencia real de, de, del cliente, de la necesidad que necesita. Que, que, que tiene de, no solo es el hecho de, de esta intervención bancaria, es la inseguridad absoluta que le está dando todo. Cuando tienes un proyecto de vida, unas expectativas y esto se rompe, es que es tan fácil como poner en, en cualquier persona, tú, que vas mañana al banco y te dicen que ese dinero no lo puedes tocar, que se está, te están investigando por, un, por, por una sospecha de blanqueo, te hacen aportar toda la documentación sobre ese dinero, me da igual que, es, que estamos hablando de 10.000 euros, que de 100.000 euros, que de un millón de euros, que de 90 millones de euros. Da igual el perfil. Y tampoco sabes cuándo podrás disponer de este dinero. Y tampoco te pagas a la justicia. There's been no proven of any wrongdoing, no money laundering so far. Actualmente no hay ninguna sentencia condenatoria por blanqueo de capitales. No lo sé, no, 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 no sé que hay mucho dinero. Yo como dije, yo soy solamente un abogado. Sí. Yo, yo porto del orden de 20 clientes. Es la, la única referencia cierta que tengo. Es una sensación, pero yo sé que no, es, no son pocos dineros, porque sé que ya han muchos casos de clientes que no pasen al tall. Un té, yo porto casos, un té 15 millones, el otro 10 millones, el otro 200 millones. Pero, so PricewaterhouseCoopers' job is now finished, yes? No, uh, there are, they are still here. Four years later? Yes, yes. Are, are they still working on this today? Is Pricewaterhouse still? Yes. What are they doing today? Well, I'm asking for stupid things. Justify that we are money landers. In this process, everybody are guilty until proved they are innocent. Esto fue la intervención del banco por parte del gobierno. Eso no había sucedido nunca. Se crea un organismo que no existía en Andorra y se crea solamente por este caso, que se llama AREP. Agencia de Resolución de Entidades Bancarias. On April 2nd, 2015, 23 days after America's Section 311, a new law is passed in Andorra and Arab is formed. With the purpose of managing the processes of resolution of banking entities, with its board of directors appointed by the Minister of Finance, Jordi Sinca, and the ANAF, directed by Maria Kassan. A esta entidad se le dan unas, fac unas facultades extraordinarias, nunca vistas, puede hacer. One of the chief architects of the new Andorran law that created Arab was Xavier Espot, Andorra's Minister of Justice at this time, who today is now the elected president of Andorra. Hay uh, dos momentos clave en los que Xavier Espot uh, uh, interviene o tiene responsabilidades en la crisis eh, provocada por la intervención de la BPA. Primero, porque horas antes de que se hiciera pública la Notice of Fin de FinCEN, su familia retiró dinero de la BPA, concretamente 90.000 euros, en las horas previas a que se hiciera pública la Notice. Con lo cual, es evidente que él conocía y su familia conocía que se iba a producir uh, esta comunicación del FinCEN. Y luego también hay una intervención decisiva de Xavier Spot 
cuando eh, se produce la aprobación de la Ley de Creación de la Agencia de Resolución de Entidades Bancarias, o Ley de la AREP, o Ley de la BPA, es como se conoce. Pero eh, hay una manipulación, una manipulación muy clara, porque la Directiva Europea del año 2014 establece que cuando se produce una crisis bancaria, eh, todos los accionistas eh, están afectados. Pero en la ley que aprueba el gobierno andorrano y el parlamento andorrano cambian y se establece que solo serán afectados por esta medida, por esta ley, todos los accionistas que tengan más del 10% del capital. Esto es importante porque eh, la familia del ministro de Interior y Justicia y actual eh, jefe de gobierno de Andorra, de Xavier Spot, eran accionistas minoritarios de la BPA. After then Minister of Justice Xavier Espot manipulated the Arab law, his family were allowed to keep all of their cash deposits at BPA, while the majority shareholders and founders of BPA and Banco Madrid, Raymond and Hajini Sierco, locally known as the Sierco brothers, watched all of their cash deposits vanish, as did many members of BPA's general management. Not only were Xavier Espot's family the second largest shareholders of BPA, they are a very wealthy family that own a chain of 70 luxury cosmetic stores across Spain and Andorra, Julia Perfumery, who were also named in the Panama Papers. Arab begins plans to create a good bank to place what PricewaterhouseCoopers has deemed as legitimate assets, segregated from BPA, with plans to immediately sell the new bank once it's set up. June 17, 2015, three months after America's Section 311, Arab creates Val Bank as its new Good Bank, where 67.6% of BPA's deposits are safely placed, with the remaining 32.4% being placed into what is locally referred to as the BPA tomb. Two days later, Andorra's co-prince, the Prime Minister of France, travels to Andorra for the first time in history. Del tema BPA, il y a eu une réaction rapide et réfléchi pour isoler la banque contaminée. Followed in December by Andorra's other co-prince from Spain. Andorra a experimentat en aquest any 2015 la seva fragilitat. El nostre país va poder reconèixer els seus amics i els qui no van ser tant. I a mi m'agrada recordar que no ser corrupte comença per un mateix. Todo esto en un estado donde está un obispo, un representante de la Iglesia Católica como copríncipe, como jefe de estado, es increíble, es absolutamente escandaloso, porque el obispo era cómplice, y no solo esto, el obispo tiene cuentas en la banca andorrana, el, el obispo ha recibido de la banca andorrana. Y esto es una grave denuncia para el Vaticano. Also at this time, the Sierco brothers begin engaging in a multi-year legal battle with the United States Treasury and FinCEN, even addressing the director of FinCEN herself, Jennifer Calvary. Our view was then, and still my view now, that a great injustice was done to these folks. BPA was one of the good ones. The moment that the Section 311 notice was issued, that no, um, had the intent and effect of all U.S. banks saying, we will no longer clear your dollars. And when an international bank can no longer clear dollars, they're done. They weren't questioned, they weren't asked, they weren't given a day to explain themselves. It just happened and overnight they were shut down. You have a chance to respond, but by the time you respond, uh, you've been out of business for a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month. No U.S. bank will deal with you, and you're finished. And again, you say, well, how can you expropriate a bank? Section 311 of the Patriot Act allows them to do it. We challenge that. We said there must be, there must be some way to say, no, 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 you've gotten it wrong here. Let's get this sorted out. But of course, it behooves the Treasury to run out the clock. Because the longer that a bank stays without the ability to operate, the less chance there is 
to reinstate it. And it goes down to the vanishing point very quickly. Later on, when the family owner of the bank was going to a lawyers in the United States, trying to get justice from this operation, Finson, exceptionally, withdrew the measure and the accusation against BPA. February 19, 2016. FinCEN withdraws its finding under Section 311 regarding Banca Pravada de Andorra, as BPA no longer operates in a manner that poses a threat to the U.S. financial system. Less than one year after issuing the notice, uh, the FinCEN withdraws the notice. The notice that has been withdrawn quicker in the whole history of FinCEN, establishing a record. This is very strange. The fact was that the petition to the court was to get the document or the information that have conducted Finson to take this strong decision. And the judge said, well, if Finson withdraw the measure, there is no documents required. If it is withdrawn, there is no accusation, no guiltiness, and you can go away. Yes, but we are dead. You had in your hands a knife. You killed me, but then you take the knife out of my body and say, well, no, no, the, the knife is here. If you die, that's up to you. And it was a strategic maneuver to essentially take away the notice that was the trigger that gave us a right to respond. And so it was a truly arbitrary use of power that was unreviewable to shut down a bank without any meaningful ability to go forward. And so we ended up where the U.S. government coordinated with another country, made a victim of a private bank, shut it down, made it unable to uh, come back to life, sold the assets for a, you know, for a pittance, to another, a, different, a U.S. entity called J.C. Flowers. Chris, you have a history of buying cheap assets in crisis times. Uh, we do try to buy banks in times of crisis, but we have mostly stuck to the mature markets, not the emerging markets. That adds its own level of colorful risk, which might be too colorful for us. <laughs> April 21st, 2016, 13 months after America's Section 311, American private equity firm J.C. Flowers purchases Val Bank. Uh, good morning, my name is Ferran Sicard. I'm an economist, partner of a company called uh, Traces. We were charged uh, for analyzing some specific uh, economic aspects of uh, the, the operation set up around BPA and uh, the bridge bank created to uh, resolve I mean, the, the situation. At the end of the day, summarizing <laughs> In one of the most convoluted, confusing, yet clever displays of sheer economic gymnastics, a story that by itself deserves its own feature documentary, J.C. Flowers purchased Val Bank, a business valued at 119 million euros from the government of Andorra for only 16.6 million euros. To simplify the details of this transaction, the sale price of Val Bank was 29.8 million euros, but JC Flowers paid 3.8 million euros. The convertible bonds or shares of common stock in the bank were valued at 70 million euros, but JC Flowers paid 12.8 million euros, meaning that JC Flowers acquired an existing profitable international business at an astounding 86% discount. What means this? That, well, they make a very big profit, very, I mean, when, when, I, when I say they, I mean J.C. Flowers. Have you ever seen anything like this in your career? No, no, I am 73 years old, and I, I have never seen, I, I even cannot imagine something like this because... The owners, the original owners of BPA lost everything with the sale of the bank to J.C. Flowers. And so, you are spending time and effort and money to do an autopsy, not to try and do a cure 
for what's happened. America's actual Section 311 notice against BPA claimed that BPA had facilitated transactions involving the proceeds of organized crime, corruption, human trafficking, and fraud for the Mexican Sinaloa drug cartel, the country of Venezuela, Russian criminal organizations, and companies in China. The entire scope of America's allegation that BPA was laundering money for the Chinese related to a Chinese businessman named Gao Ping. Gao Ping immigrated from China to Spain in the 1990s and rose from a small-time cook in a Chinese restaurant to becoming a big-time multi-million euro businessman and art dealer. He initially built his fortune by importing Chinese leather products into Spain and then reselling the products for cash. In 2012, more than two years before America's Section 311, Gao Ping and dozens more were arrested in Spain in one of the biggest tax evasion operations in Spanish history. Gao Ping is not crying of Andorra, has never come to Andorra, and we have never seen him. Gao Ping's only relationship to Andorran banking was through one of his high-ranking managers, Rafael Pallardo, who was also arrested in 2012. In fact, Rafael Pallardo had multiple bank accounts linked to Gao Ping in Andorra, not just BPA. Uh, Rafa Pallardo, he travels uh, frequently to China. They, he buy in uh, factories in China, uh, and he buy belts, bags, and leather, and things like that, and sell them in, in Barcelona. As BPA's head of compliance, Isabel requested proof that this operation was a fully legitimate business. And we start working with gas, but not too much. Gas is very, very common in, in Andorra in that moment. Gal Ping was committing tax fraud in Spain by depositing cash in Andorran banks. His operation started with Rafael Pallardo driving with cash from Spain into Andorra to deposit into his bank accounts. From there, bank wires from Pallardo's accounts would be sent to China to pay for more products to be shipped back to Spain to be sold. But in two years, the cash makes... It was something like the 2008. All the business are really, really bad, and you are like... While the world was dealing with the aftermath of the 2008 banking crisis, Rafael Pallardo began expanding this operation by granting large amounts of cash from Gao Ping's business to anyone in Spain who needed quick cash on hand, in exchange for an immediate bank wire reimbursement between bank accounts in Andorra. The economy was in crisis, so what a lot of people did is say, okay, I have this half a million euros offshore, I need that money right now just to pay salaries and to pay staff. And since the Spanish police knew this, they were at the border just controlling basically every car. And that's why they appreciated so much this system. Mm, we are not so comfortable. We are getting something like 15 euros for transfer. And we are assuming a lot of risk of the gas. We have bought Banco Madrid. BPA was aware they couldn't continue working with Spanish customers who were intentionally evading Spanish taxes while BPA was simultaneously operating a bank on Spanish soil. And for this reason, it's because we stopped the operation in 2011. 2011. Vincent Note, March 2015. Incredible. When the note appears, you say, this, this, this is prehistoria, this is past, very, very past. To summarize, BPA opens an account for Rafael Pallardo in 2008. BPA fires him as a client and closes his bank account in 2011. More than one year later, Rafael Pallardo is arrested alongside Gao Ping for tax fraud in 2012, three years before America's Section 311. But that's not the interesting part. Shortly after BPA fired Rafael Pallardo as a client in 2011, Gao Ping asked him to set up a fake meeting with one of Gao Ping's partners, Yang Jun Yang, luring two BPA employees into Yang's office in Madrid. 
pretending to see about opening a new bank account at BPA, then trying to trick BPA employees into admitting something Gao Ping could use against them, all while a hidden camera was recording the entire meeting. Oblivious to what was happening, BPA refused to open a bank account for Mr. Yang. Gao Peng tried to use this tape in a failed extortion attempt against BPA by threatening to go to the media with this tape if BPA didn't take Rafael Payardo back as their client. Rafa Pallardo is very afraid of the Chinese and they record him and then Rafa came to Andorra and asked the commercial, okay, we have a record that say that, so you are not going to stop us. And we say, okay, forget about it. If we decide to stop you, we are going to stop you. For us, it's not a problem. Go to, where are you going with this? We didn't make any, any drama of it. This video, recorded in 2011, was discovered on a USB drive by Spanish police during their massive Gao Ping tax evasion arrests in 2012. The video was publicized after 2015. March 17, 2015, one week after America's Section 311, an edited version of Gao Ping's failed extortion video suddenly appears on national Spanish media as proof that BPA was laundering money for the Chinese. A la derecha de la mesa, Yong Yu Yang, hombre de Gao Ping. A la izquierda, Mauricio Escribano, directivo de BPA y una empleada china del banco. Comienza la negociación y para Yang lo primero es dejar las cosas claras. Una vez aclarado, hablan de cantidades. El negocio de Gauping genera mucho efectivo. Dime qué volúmenes suficientemente al mes. ¿Cuál sería tu objetivo de canalizar hacia arriba? Yo puedo. No, yo. Fácilmente cinco euros. Fácilmente. ¿Pero mensuales? Fácilmente hecho. Remember when BPA's CEO John Pal Miguel Prats was arrested just 72 hours after America's Section 311 and held in prison for two years without charges? Well, the reason for John Pal's arrest was because Spanish police threw Rafael Payardo in the back of a Spanish police car, drove him across the border to Andorra, and forced Rafael to give false testimony in front of an Andorran judge against John Pal Miguel Prats, leading to his arrest. Una persona que no podía salir de España, pero sin embargo se autorizó que saliera de España para ir a Andorra y vomitar lo que vomitó, que provocó los dos años de cárcel del señor Juan Pau Miquel. Cuando al cabo de cuatro días el señor Pallardó ha dicho que todo lo que dijo fue por culpa de la presión de la policía, poco menos dice que le torturaron y que aquello que dijo era falso. Bueno, yo quisiera saber qué juez le ha abierto diligencias por mentiroso al señor Pallardó. O antes o después mintió, pero desde luego mintió. No ha hecho nadie nada. Estas son las deficiencias que yo encuentro en la estructura judicial andorrana, ¿no? Rafael Payardo's only physical evidence against John Pal Miguel Pratt was one of Rafael's own handwritten cash for wire transfer agendas with the partial name John Pal. Rafael later admits that Spanish police forced him to falsify his testimony, yet John Pal Miguel Pratt remains in Andorran custody for two years anyway. He continues to stand by his story, claiming, I have been a puppet of the prosecutor and the court who have used me to justify the intervention of the bank. But in the same agenda figures the name of some other persons in some other banks in Andorra, which should be also in jail, if the case is the same, and uh, are not, and never have been. According to reports from the Andorran Police Department, scores of people were taking advantage of Rafael Payardo's cash for wire transfer service, ranging from famed porno actor Nacho Vidal to the family of Andorra's Minister of Justice, Xavier Espot, Andorra's 2019 elected president and head of government. And in our case, everybody is processed, someone's in prison, and in the other case, nothing happened, and the case does not advance. Why not? On one hand, the police is saying the bank is hiding this, and on the other hand, is saying thank you very much, Mr. Bank, because if it wasn't because of your records, we wouldn't have been able to cross all the transactions. It was like, hey, I mean, you, you, 
Andorra had five banks at this time, Ons Bank, Credit Andorra, Mora Bank, Bank Sabadell de Andorra, and BPA. Four of Andorra's five banks were engaging in identical operations for Gao Ping through Rafael Payardo, but only BPA was intervened. They did the same operation with Gao Ping. Exactly the same operations. Exactly. They always work with Euro. Never they make any transfer or BPA receive, BPA receive uh, cash in US dollar. So this, uh, this means American authorities and uh, American correspondent banks, they couldn't know the existence of this operation. It means that the information from this client comes from Spain. America's Section 311, alleging that BPA was laundering money for the Russians, focuses on a man named Andrei Petrov. Exactly how Rafael Payardo was Gao Ping's handler, Mr. Andrei Petrov was a handler for a former decorated Russian army general, winner of the Science and Technology State Prize for the Russian Federation, and acting CEO of a company responsible for cleaning and repairing all of Russia's oil pipelines, Mr. Viktor Kanenkin. We know that this is a very important person in Russia, has a lot of money, so he, he put some money here. It's not uncommon for a man as wealthy as Viktor Kanenkin, a public figure living and working in Russia, to place their money offshore in hopes of discouraging a kidnapping or other potential security risks. So that was a client with a dossier like this. That was, for me, so clear that that client wasn't nothing wrong. Viktor Kanenkin's activity consisted of two transfers from a bank in Latvia to BPA, one in 2003 for 20 million euros and another in 2007 for 30 million euros, under the company name DDC Limited. The money came from his own company. I mean, it's a transfer from one pocket to another pocket. Change the country, nothing else. We are not selling, we are not buying, we are not making any business. I just have my money here and I want to change this to another country. Upon the 30 million euros deposit in 2007, BPA contacted the Latvian bank to confirm the standing of Viktor Kanenkin and DDC Limited. The following year, BPA commissioned Kroll, a compliance risk and diligence firm headquartered in New York City, to independently audit Viktor Kanenkin's activity for anti-money laundering and corruption. Petrov opened an account here in, in Andorra and, and gets the money from the account of uh, Victor to the account of Petrov. That's all. It's their salary. For me, like compliance, Andrei Petrov was not significant. January 2013, two years before America's Section 311 against BPA, Andrei Petrov is arrested by Spanish police for corruption and tax evasion, crimes that are completely unrelated to Victor Kanenkin. However, more than two years later, on March 23, 2015, 13 days after America's Section 311 against BPA, the Spanish media suddenly releases a series of claims linking Viktor Kanenkin to Andrei Petrov's criminal activities. Spanish media also claimed that two executives from BPA traveled to Moscow to visit Viktor Kanenkin in person, with one of those executives being Santiago Rossello which was true, as it was Santi's job as financial director of BPA to closely monitor and periodically visit a client as big as Viktor Kanenkin. The Spanish media also reports that the other BPA executive on this Moscow trip was Pablo La Plana, publishing that he had been arrested nine months earlier by Andorran police for laundering drug money. The Spanish police is lying when they say that I went to Russia. The Spanish police is lying when they say that I stayed at such hotel, it's lying when they said that I picked up my passport at the Barcelona airport. I mean, that all those are lies. Two days after this was published, the law firm of Eric Lewis wrote this Spanish newspaper requesting the removal of these defamatory claims as well as a retraction, proving he did not go to Russia and was never implicated in drug money laundering. Yet, to this day, ABC Spain has refused to edit this article, even though they are completely aware that this article is a humongous lie. 
it, it was coordinated. Finson issues the notice against BPA and suddenly all these articles about BPA, about myself, about everything just is there. This was planned. While Spanish police were arresting Andre Petrov in January 2013, something else was being coordinated. The police called me. Hey, hi, Isabel, I'm the police. I have a, an account that has to be locked today. It was a Friday night. I said, okay, I'm having dinner with my, with my husband at the, at the restaurant. No, 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 we have to lock it now. I say, the bank is closed. It's not, nothing is going to happen to Monday. No, 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 Isabel, you have to go to the bank and you have to lock it right now. Okay, bring me the, the notice to the, to the restaurant. He came to the restaurant. I was having dinner and I opened the, the envelope and I, I see, I sign and I see Victor Kanaikin, the Russian. Oh my God. I remember that customer because it was a big customer. And when the police left, I take the phone and I called Santi. My phone, in, when the Russian people were closed in jail in January 2013, my, my phone was being tapped. And all my conversations were recorded during one month. I didn't know. And he said, hi, Santi, Sabel here. The police has come, they have locked Victor Kanaiki, Andre Petrov Bosch. Santi says, what? But that's not possible. He's a businessman, we have everything. Yes, I'm sure that we have everything perfect in that account. We have nothing to, to worry because the account is perfectly documented. Okay, okay, bye bye. When we know this, we offer my presentation to the Audiencia Nacional saying we don't understand what happened with me. If I can explain what you need, I come to the Audiencia Nacional to explain whatever you like. They say, no, don't worry, you, you are not relevant in the case and you are not a part of the case. This is in 2013. When in 2015 we have the intervention of BPA, Spain then decides to resurrect this case. Santi was suddenly facing a year in jail and 300,000 euros in fines if convicted. The police make the interpretation of the conversation. Clearly, both of them know what's happening. And they are saying that everything is perfect because they know that we were recording them and they want to hide that there is something wrong. That was the police interpretation of my conversation with Santi. Santi's case finally made it to court in October 2018, only to be immediately acquitted. Because there was no case. It was not appealed by the persecutor, so it's film, this is absolution. I know that uh, Petrov has also an account in, in a bank. According to Andorran police reports, showing records dating as far back as 2007, Andrei Petrov was also using Bank for his activities, with more than three quarters of a million euros in deposits. Yet, no action has ever been taken against Bank or its employees. FinCEN's Section 311 against BPA also claims that Andrei Petrov is suspected to have links to Simeon Mogilevich, one of the FBI's most wanted fugitives. This may be the most powerful man you've never heard of. His name is Semyon Mogilevich, the Russian mobster. He has access to so much, including funding, including other criminal organizations, that he can, with a telephone call, affect the global economy. Yet, no state agency has produced a shred of evidence to support a link between the two men. One day, Santi comes to me and says, hey, um, send a coordinate a meeting between the, the new manager of the International Business Unit and uh, Mr. Petrov. I just sent an SMS to Petrov. I have never seen him before, I have never interacted with him before. And because of that SMS, the Spanish police tapped my phone. While Santi was a lead manager for BPA's Russian clients involved in America's Section 311, Pablo was a lead manager for BPA's Venezuelan clients involved in America's Section 311. America's FinCEN alleges that a money laundering network engaged in a wide variety of business for illicit profit.
connected to Venezuelan government officials, including Venezuela's public oil company, PDVSA, the owner of Citgo at the time. PDVSA as such never sent money to BPA. And this is something that blows my mind uh, when, they, when I read their notice of finding. Because you won't find any single transaction sent from PDVSA, PDVSA to BPA. While manufacturing the story that BPA was laundering money for the Venezuelans, the Spanish police had to get really creative. During this national Spanish news broadcast that aired on April 7, 2015, a month after America's Section 311, the audience was told that the Spanish police had been tapping the phones of BPA executives while trying to follow the Russian mafia. But suddenly, the Venezuelans just happened to appear on the scene. So Spanish police started tapping the phones related to BPA's Venezuelan clients. Even though Spain's police were tapping phones inside Andorra, the Spanish police had no jurisdiction to intervene in a case between Venezuela and Andorra. And this is where America's FinCEN came in. Spanish police then presented to America's FinCEN evidence of money laundering at BPA for all the clients mentioned in America's Section 311, including Venezuela, thus resulting in America shutting down BPA and Banco Madrid. The first time I saw a conversation of mine was on a newspaper. I read and the transcription was so wrong. But the next wave was that shocked me was when I started to hear, then to see in the, in the television, to, to hear my conversations. During this same April 7, 2015 broadcast, Spanish media started playing Pablo Laplana's re-edited phone conversations on national television as proof that BPA was laundering money for the Venezuelans. Pablo Laplana had no idea his phone was being recorded in 2013, until he watched and heard his own re-edited phone conversations broadcast live on national Spanish TV in April 2015, two years later, perfectly coinciding with America's Section 311 against BPA. It's very frustrating when they're lying and you say, but I can prove that that's not true, and, but you can't. Pablo immediately hired an attorney and took this case to court in May of 2015, just weeks after the first broadcast. His attorney presented diagrams to the court, showing how his conversations had been highly manipulated when aired. But no retractions were ordered, and the Spanish justice system did nothing to remedy the situation. When, 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 I, when you're watching, when you're hearing your conversations and you see that those have been edited, I can't describe, I can't find the words to describe the, the level of frustration and anger that that generates. With Venezuela, there are two types of business. One with the insurance company. BPA's Venezuelan clients consisted partly of international insurance brokers who shopped for reinsurers, like Guy Carpenter or Lloyds of London, to insure various national businesses in Venezuela. And the other with the China companies. These clients also brokered deals to build factories in Venezuela using Chinese technology, as well as importing wholesale vehicles from China for retail in Venezuela. It's a commercial operative. We, we, we get the money in Andorra from the company with the taxes, with the deduction, with all the everything. Publicly released Andorran court documents redacted the names of the numerous Venezuelan clients of BPA. But they did list the other banks they were working with, with these banks depositing 90% of the Venezuelans' capital into BPA, with this list of banks that the Venezuelans had wired most of its money to. Yet, no bank in this list was ever investigated or had a Section 311 placed against them. In the case of the Venezuelans, it's very curious because they are Venezuelans who don't live in Venezuela and who, además, no participate del poder en Venezuela, es decir, eh, han huido de Venezuela, no, no, no están al lado de Maduro. Entonces, es muy difícil llegar a entender que esto sea así. This case was under vigilance of the unit of financial investigation in Andorra. They considered its activity suspicious when we were asked for these clients to get 50 million dollars away from the bank, we advised, and they immediately said, no, 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 block the money. 
and then the person in charge put it in a court and accused these people of money laundering. In November 2012, more than two years before America's Section 311, the blocking of Venezuelan assets at BPA for this alleged money laundering went to trial in Andorra. The court's final decision was to lift and void this imposed block, finding no wrongdoing. The general attorney was not confident with this decision and asked to investigate it again. This case was then escalated to a higher Andorran court, dated July of 2014, eight months before America's Section 311, still without having provided sufficient evidence of crime or money laundering. The money was finally delivered, but not all. They still left some money in the bank. They were innocent. Joseph and Tony Silvestri was one of the local Andorran attorneys representing the Venezuelans in this case. The judge and uh and the tribunal, the highest tribunal, says that no proof that Venezuelans uh, make laundry money and, and freeze all the accounts. After this, me and all the lawyer uh, receive the, the payment of our services. After that uh, came the, the FinCEN notice and uh, talk about the Venezuelan citizens and freeze again the accounts with all the process anti-money laundering of uh, BPA look my account and the account of the other lawyer and say hey what's this amount this amount came from the Venezuelan uh, the judge unfreeze and say ah okay you're a laundry you, you, you make laundry money are you crazy is the judge who on freeze is a judge who say there are no proof. In Andorra, to be a lawyer is a, a, a risky profession. This is human rights attorney and partner of the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, Gonzalo Boye, who has been representing Joseph and Tony in this case. The judge who released the money before the Finson note is the same judge, is the same person the same human being that is charging Sylvester and the other lawyers for money laundering out of the money that she has declared is clean money. So at the end of the day, you don't know what to do. I mean, you win a case, out of that case you're paid, and you end up in a worse situation than the client that you acquitted. After that, start a case against me and against my wife because she's co-owner of the account. I think this is a, a process to make fear to the, to the lawyers. All my money in BPA, all my money of all my career was freeze everything. I lost everything. I start from zero. Um, I'm upset. Together, they are currently seeking the attention of the United Nations, demonstrating massive human rights violations within the country of Andorra. If you don't know how to manage a case, you indict the lawyer. That's the problem in Andorra. And finally, the fourth case in America's Section 311 alleges that BPA worked with the Sinaloa drug cartel in Mexico and facilitated the transfer of bulk cash derived from narcotics trafficking in the United States. This would mean that the Sinaloa drug cartel, after being cut off from HSBC in the United States for doing this exact same thing, with no Section 311 being ordered against HSBC, would now manage to somehow transport huge amounts of cash by boat or plane from the United States to Andorra to then deposit into BPA. It's possible that FinCEN is too stupid to put this case in the, in the note. I never found a single indicator, whatever, nor has anyone pointed to one that had anything to do with the Sinaloa cartel or anybody else. And there's nothing that even sniffs at that. That's, that's what we found. Uh, and now when we have been in the U.S. through all the different courts, and we arrive to the end, and one of the judges asked the uh, prosecutor representing FinCEN, 
said, well, have you shown any proofs? And all she can respond is that we have issued uh, a statement about this. And the judge, he asks at her again, uh, this is an English process. At any instance, from the beginning, have you shown any proofs of the charges that you have against BPA that has justified the intervention of the bank? She says, well, what we have done is issue. And he gets upset and said, listen, have you or have you not shown any proofs? And she has nothing to say because he is upset already at this point. He said, no, Your Honor. That's where we are. I mean, they're, they're building everything based on the criminal credibility of FinCEN, not on evidence, because if they could have got evidence, this case will be in the U.S., in a U.S. court, and not in an Andorran court. I mean, the whole Andorran judicial system, you can put it into one courtroom in New York. Why did you choose this to do it? Because you don't have a case. It was the time of the U.S. being very careful and watchful of what was going on in Venezuela, you know, being with the Russians. So they put like the spices to make it all tasteful and appealing to the U.S. government. Let's go for this. Plus, this is a small country, no strategic interest whatsoever, a small bank, so no one's really going to complain about this. Uh, we have a political and strategic interest in getting along with the Spanish. They may not fully believe the Spanish, but say, just go along with them, go with the flow, let's make them happy. And so you've got two countries coordinating, but they're basically coordinating to deprive in, you know, innocent folks from being able to have a meaningful remedy. It's troubling, it should be troubling to everybody, and that can, could happen to anyone, anywhere. And the banks uh, are not going to fight, and the foreign regulators aren't going to fight. They didn't fight for their bank. They, they decided that they would circle the wagons around the other banks and do the U.S.'s bidding. The penalty would be borne by the Catalans in their midst. The penalty would be borne by the Catalans in their midst. By now, you are likely asking yourself, why? What would be the motivation for Andorra and Spain to justify framing BPA for money laundering, intentionally destroying the bank and countless lives in the process? It's got a name. Lofer. That's the reality. Everything that's behind this issue is a lawfare. It's a war with other means, which is uh, using legal tools within the legal system to destroy the enemies in a way that appears to be legal. So they explore the, the contradictions of the law and they use the legal system. Why? Because normally uh, in, in each country, the, the, juris, the, the judicial system doesn't get a counterpower, a counterpower or, or, or checks and balance. And what had happened in Andorra is exactly the same. They wanted to protect the bank, who was convenient for them, and they want to destroy it another. Why this other bank, BPA, was not convenient? because they didn't want to play along in certain things that were important both for Andorra and also for Spain, which was a campaign to destroy the Catalan movement. For, for me, it was not a surprise, because we know perfectly how the Spanish state acts or, or reacts when Spain feels threatened by someone. It's a former empire. As a former empire, made by violence and genocides, he has no limits. And he has a sense of the power linked to the concept of impunity. It doesn't matter if Andorra is an independent and sovereign state. The Spanish police could act inside the Spanish state and also in Andorra. So for us, it was not a surprise to discover the dark side of the Spanish state is acting against Catalan interest.
Spain consists of 17 regions, the most famous being Madrid, Spain's ruling capital, and Catalonia, where Barcelona is located. These two regions have been in bitter conflict for centuries. In the 18th century, Spain has tried to eliminate Catalan, no? introduce Spanish. And during the through the administration, the public administration, and through the roads, and through the school, because at this time, during two centuries, it was really, Catalan was forbidden in the schools. During many times, for instance, the papers in Catalan were forbidden, and the broadcast in Catalan was forbidden, and the television at the time of France was forbidden. The Spanish language was first imposed on the Catalan people nearly 300 years ago, even though most spoke only Catalan. Successive Spanish governments launched decree after decree to weaken the use of the Catalan language. In 1881, it was banned on legal documents. In 1896, in public meetings and on the telephone. In 1900, in the theater. In 1939, when Francisco Franco came to power, it was banned absolutely everywhere. People caught speaking in Catalan were arrested and severely beaten. Speaking or even reading a book in Catalan in public places was considered a direct protest against Franco's long-running fascist regime, a regime that has left Spain second only to Cambodia for the highest number of missing persons. You had a fascist dictator, Franco, in Spain. You had this fascist dictator, Hitler, in Germany. When that resolved, there was trials. There was a conclusion to that. And there was no conclusion. Anything you want to say in that regard? Yes, yes, I can. Yes, uh, mm, it was a fake. The Spanish transition to democracy was a fake. Because first, Franco has that in a bet as a head of a state. No revolution, no process against fascism has uh, removed Franco from power, but biology. Since the death of Francisco Franco in 1975, the ghost of his fascist ideals remain prominent in Spain to this day. Viva España! With the continued repression of Catalonia taking center stage. Ever since I was a little girl, I've been seeing these differences. I would go to the supermarket and I would find an elder woman speaking in Spanish with her grandchild, telling them in Spanish, don't buy this, this is Catalan. And I would think, you are living in Catalonia, how can you say that? How can you be opposing a product that's made in this land? This has nothing to do with politics. I have traveled a lot in Spain uh, since I was a little kid and I would find people insulting me and my sister for speaking in Catalan with each other. They would come to us and say, you are in Spain, you should speak Spanish. Like very ugly situations and very uncomfortable situations. And I've been encountering this my entire life. The first Catalonian Statute of Autonomy was passed by the Spanish Parliament in 1932 after Catalonia held a public vote, or referendum, with 99% of Catalonians voting in favor of this statute. But seven years later, once Francisco Franco took power, this statute was abolished, resulting in four decades of repression and bloodshed against the Catalonian people. After Franco died in 1975, another statute of autonomy was drafted and passed in 1979, but it granted Catalonia only limited autonomy. From 1980 to 2003, President Jordi Pujol dedicated his presidency to Catalonia's right to self-governance and gave birth to what is known today 
as the Catalonian independence movement. When Pujol uh, stepped down in 2003, a new uh, government in uh, Catalonia appeared. The main uh, goal of uh, that new government was to develop a new statute of autonomy for the country. I was the head of the opposition at that time in the Catalan parliament. I was fully involved in this uh, political operation. And then uh, I personally negotiated with uh, President Zapatero at that time, the Spanish prime minister. I negotiated with him the statute of autonomy. And we reached an agreement. And that agreement was transformed in a Spanish law approved in the Spanish parliament by an absolute majority. Then that law was sent to Catalonia. And in Catalonia, there was a binding referendum. And the outcome of the referendum was 74% of the yes vote. So the statute of autonomy, the new statute of autonomy was okay. And uh, four years after that, in 2010, uh, the uh, Spanish constitutional court struck down the main articles of the new Statute of Autonomy in Catalonia that had been previously uh, approved in a binding referendum by uh, people. One of the members of the uh, judges of the tri Constitutional Tribunal, which is the top, the one that said doesn't matter what the people has decided, doesn't matter what the parliaments, this cannot happen, came to New York because he and his wife were very close friends to one of my in-laws. At home, we had breakfast at home. I said, why all this? You know, why don't we try? And he told me, Miguel, you the Catalans make money. But don't forget, Spain is run from Madrid. In 2012, 2013, there were in Catalonia and in Barcelona specifically, huge demonstrations, more than 1.5 million people in the streets asking for a, a referendum and this is what I tried to negotiate with uh, President Rajoy at that time, Spanish Prime Minister. And the answer of uh, President Rajoy was always the same. There is nothing to talk about. My position was if you look at what is really happening in Catalonia and you see in a consolidated democracy that more than 1.5 million people are in the streets asking for a referendum your answer is, there is nothing to talk about. In November 2014, President Artur Mas decided to hold a non-binding, symbolic referendum. Not an actual referendum, the equivalent of taking an opinion poll of the Catalonian population for self-autonomy. 80% of voter turnout voted in favor of independence. Back in Madrid, President Mariano Rajoy's government responded by convicting President Artur Mas of civil disobedience, banned him from holding public office for two years, and fined his party nearly 5 million euros. Mayor of Girona, Carles Puigdemont, has been voted in as the new president of Catalonia. The move puts the northeastern region back on the road to secession from Spain after months of political deadlock and waning support in his predecessor, Artur Mas. We are a minority, a national minority in Spain. We are only 16% of the Spanish population. So we have no power enough to be uh, respected our decision because we are a minority. So the only tool in the international law that protect minorities is the right of self-determination. And the only way to achieve that is to be independent. In October 2017, President Carles Puigdemont authorized a binding referendum for Catalonia's independence. There are a lot of people in Catalonia who, who doesn't want independence, but they want to vote. And then want to decide together with the others their future. And when I saw that day, and then I see also my, my uh, regards that day, um, there is only a word, hope. Obviously there was another word, violence. Police are breaking their way into a building, so it looks very clear at this very early stage in the voting process that Madrid is not going to let this happen.
Well, here you can see protesters in Girona in northeastern Catalonia facing off against officers. Well, demonstrators have their hands up in a sign of non-violence, but police apparently started hitting them with batons. Well, another video from Catalonia shows police jumping on and violently kicking protesters, as well as dragging the activists out of a polling station. Tossing peaceful voters downstairs, striking them with batons and confiscating ballot boxes. Catalans lined up to vote, many paying a high price for it. Now, people are still trying to vote here, but we do know that uh, just two blocks away, uh, there, was, uh, there was another polling station, another building of the school that was just basically raided by police forces. That was very disappointing for me, to discover Spain has not changed. I was very sad seeing uh, the hate in the face of Spanish policemen. They were activists in the name of the unity of Spain. They were not worried about the image of Spain, the, that, e the, that image uh, Spain offers to the world as an authoritarian state, violent state. It doesn't matter about that. It was a sh uh, also a day of shame for Spain and a day of shame for Europe. I conducted my interview with President Puigdemont in September 2019 in Belgium, where he remains in exile. But just four weeks after my interview, this happened. Nine Catalan leaders will spend between nine and 13 years behind bars for their roles in staging an independence referendum back in 2017. The vast majority of voters said they were in favor of breaking from Spain, and the regional parliament declared Catalonia's independence. But weeks later, Spain nullified the independence declaration, dissolved Catalonia's parliament, and took direct control of the region. Spain's Supreme Court handed down the sentences Monday after finding the former leaders guilty of sedition. Thus triggering the worst political crisis in Spain since the era of Franco. Angry Catalonians managed to shut down Barcelona's airport and highway system. Madrid's repression of Catalonia isn't just about culture. It's also about money. According to a January 2020 Treasury report, in 2015 and 2016 alone, Catalonia contributed to Spain 33.6 billion euros more than it received. So, what does Madrid's war with Catalonia have to do with assassinating a private bank in Andorra? Wait until you get a load of this. In May of 2014, 10 months before America's Section 311 against BPA. BPA's CEO, John Pau Miguel Prats, is visited by the attaché to the Spanish Embassy in Andorra, Celestino Barroso. John Pau Miguel, highly suspicious of this meeting, decided to record this conversation with his phone. Yo he portado un mensaje de Madrid. Sí. Eh, me han dicho que le comunique y que la señor Gilio, así que la señor Ramón, que eran los introductores que me había comunicado, pero bueno, el señor Gilio me dice que comunique los reportes también. Entonces me han dicho que el Banco de España, que le comunique lo siguiente, el Banco de España está haciendo una inspección a Banco Madrid y se le van a cargar. Y hay una, una empresa americana dispuesta a, a hacer sobre el banco. Cuando el Banco de España se cargue la actual... Pero, pero me transmitan que eso depende de ustedes el que se quede en nada, que se para la inspección y que todo diga como, 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 como está en la actualidad. Siempre cuando ustedes accedan a algo que yo no sé. Y ustedes el inspector 
embajado, embajada de España, sí, es policía. Sí, sí, es inspector jefe de policía. Inspector, inspector jefe del Cuerpo Nacional de Policía. Sí, sí, sí. Estoy aquí en la ciudad, el encargado de interior, embajada de España. Esto es una misión muy mía, pero bueno. Pero bueno, entiendo que es oficial, o, o tiene un carácter oficial todo esto que está diciendo. O... Vamos a dejarlo entrecomillado. Ya. Y, y con, bueno, pues, bueno, pues, con quién me tengo que ver, o con quién. Hombre, yo particularmente yo que no sé más, que no sé, no sé, aunque quisiera saber, pues no sé, ya, que no ya, sé no, más. No, ya, ya, no saben, sí, esa frase, que el Banco de España se va a cargar Banca, 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 Banco Madrid y que hay americanos dispuestos a hacerse cargo una vez que el Banco de España le da el hachazo, hay que meter a americanos a ver el cargo. Y que todo eso se puede paralizar siempre y cuando ustedes accedan, que, que está en su mano para en su mano. ¿Qué se le va a pedir? No lo sé. Jean-Paul Miguel then traveled to Madrid for this mystery meeting. The person meeting him was the head of internal affairs of the National Spanish Police, Martin Blas. This is sworn courtroom testimony of what happened in this meeting. La primera trobada allà al Villamant de Madrid ya es cuando se troba amb el Félix, que es el Martin Blas, y qué es lo que le digo a aquest señor no, mira, oye, es que tengo que pedirte una cosa y tal, y quiero que estés muy atento. Y, y tal, y ahora va a abrir un, un diario y en vez de esa leche un texto que posaba, eh, más o menos, eh, pero posaba eh, el Estado español está en guerra contra, contra Cataluña, el tema del nacionalismo es nuestra prioridad, eh, queremos que nos informe y nos dé las cuentas, que tenga usted conocimiento eh, de la familia más Junqueras y Pujol. Eso se acusaba escrita más y va a el diario y me habías entendido lo que te estoy pidiendo y tal. The uh, investigation led by uh, the Spanish government in uh, Andorra trying to find uh, personal accounts of uh, President Pujol, uh, my accounts and uh, Vice President Oriol Junqueras. In my case, uh, well, they failed because there were no accounts in Andorra, although they thought that uh, they were there, but they weren't. <laughs> he said that we do not have them as a client except Pujol, but he could not give any information because this was not legal and he could not. Well, then, if you do not do, um, accept the consequences. This is a coordinated work between Spanish police and the Treasury Department. At least, at least. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Because one highest rank officer of the Guardia Civil in Spain. Y en los centros de salud eh, habría que hacer un estudio de aquellos donde, se, donde la incidencia donde el riesgo sea mayor. Went into TV saying this. Para iniciar el Departamento del Tesoro una investigación seria contra la BPA como un banco que favorece el blanqueo de capitales a nivel mundial. So they, they, they even themselves they admitting what they did. Also, this man, Jose Manuel Villarejo, the former commissioner for the Spanish police, was also hired to help frame BPA. Villarejo is a very Spanish character. I mean, he has been very high and now is sitting in a cell in a prison, but Villarejo is a key person alongside with other policemen in what was called Catalonia Operation, Operation Catalonia, which is very much related with the blockage and the destroying of BPA. But when I'm saying very high, he was working for the government he was a police officer, but also a private entrepreneur. He intermediated in a lot of complicated situations. And when I say complicated situations, people that were journalists kidnapped in Syria by terrorist groups uh, and things like that. But he was making money out of everything while he was a civil servant. And he has admitted several things. One of those is that he lied in order to destroy BPA. Where are the consequences? Until now, we haven't seen it. I mean, he got such an amount of information that he talks properly, seriously, clearly, with all the evidence on the table. Whew. In Spain, some people will have 
big, big troubles. Even though the ruling government of Andorra is comprehensively aware that BPA was framed by Spain and tricked the U.S. Treasury by presenting fake evidence, thus fully aware of the innocence of the managers of BPA, Andorra's prosecutors are still trying to imprison BPA's top managers for money laundering. This fake criminal case continues into 2020, five years after America's Section 311. This is something unbelievable. The first thinking is that you cannot believe it. When you wake up every morning, you say, well, it must be something wrong. I, 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 I have not wake up. I must still be dreaming because this is not real. But when you finally see that it is real, then comes a situation in which a depression faces in because you, you cannot accept that and it uh, threats all your parts of your life, your family, and uh, as I feel, a lot of companions which are in the same position, a lot of them for which I put my hand on the fire. And it's impossible that the things that we are being accused of are true. I have a lot of uh, anger in, in myself. I, I know that it's not good and it's not healthy, but I really do, I cannot uh, avoid that. I came to Andorra to work at PPA, in fact. So I have been living here for more than 20 years. I'm Andorra now, first I was Spanish, and I, I feel really, really bad. I get the passport, the Andorran passport, because my children are Andorran, my husband is Andorran, and I want to be all in the, in the same country. But if it's not for that, I, I would... <laughs> I will not get the, the Andorran passport because I feel really betrayed, really betrayed. I feel really betrayed from the supervisor, from the justice, from everywhere. Because I have been in a lot of meetings with the supervisor telling that we are doing things right, that we are working good, with the colleagues of other banks saying that, OK, Isabel, please explain me how you do this. OK, oh, that's a good idea. Let's make this. Let's talk about this. And at least they say that we are money landers. We were working together because we were very interested in, in avoid money laundering with the police. I have called the police a lot of times and we have always helping them because we thought that we are on the, on the right side. I mean, the, the, the reputational damage has been so big that I, I'm an employer, as I said. I mean, no, no company will hire me at, at all because the reputation risk is very high for that company. And if you, even if you want to start a business, you will find yourself that you will need to get a bank account for that business. And it will be very hard to do that. I have still block all the money in an MBPA. You have no access to that money? No. Yeah. But not only this. I went to all the banks from Andorra to open an account. And no bank opened me an account. <laughs> I leave from my wife. How much money is missing in BPA? Do we know how much? From, from the customers of BPA, from the, the owners, uh, in everything, all maybe one billion. One, one, more than one billion. Would, would you say this was like a clever bank robbery? Would you call it that? I have this feeling. What do you think would happen if someone decided to allow everyone who had money in BPA to have their money back? What do you think would happen? There is not enough money. At all. At all, there is not enough money. Uh, if someone, uh, the justice, uh, will ask to, to redo everything and everybody get the money back from BPA, it's not possible because there will not be enough money to to get back to the customers. Which is precisely why the Andorran justice system needs a guilty verdict. Andorra has even gone so far as to publish the names of everyone from BPA facing prison on the front page of its largest newspaper, advertising how long they will spend in prison and how much they will be paying in fines when found guilty. Jean-Paul, eight years in prison, 100 million euros in fines. Santiago, eight years in prison, 70 million euros in fines. 
Isabel, seven years in prison, 70 million euros in fines. Joan, six years in prison, 70 million euros. Pablo, six years in prison, 70 million euros. You are guilty before trial. And because you are guilty before trial, um, in, in front of the public opinion, the state has the permission, has allowed, to do all that state thinks necessary to stop you, to prevent your success, not only law fair, but also media fair. Andorra is a country peculiar. Andorra is a country where things happen that only happen there. I don't know if you'll be able to find the translation, but Andorra is a chiringuito. It's a chiringuito. It's a montage. To make matters more absurd, while Andorra is busy trying to place its own innocent citizens in prison, the Andorran government is simultaneously filing lawsuits against Spain for extorting and framing BPA for money laundering. Y es un, una violación de derechos humanos, porque desde el, desde el punto de vista eh, de que vengan unos policías a hacer una actuación aquí, aquí en Andorra contra unos ciudadanos andorranos, esto es una violación claramente de la soberanía andorrana por parte de un Estado. Veremos a ver cómo evoluciona la causa, veremos a ver qué, qué se obtiene eh, ahora hay testigos, eh, se ha testificado el señor Villarejo, veremos cómo el juez va investigando. I could not get a single member of the Andorran government to speak to me on camera about this story, with the exception of the head of the Andorran Institute for Human Rights. Aquesta película que es va que es va montar, que es va fer, dient de que hi havia aquest banc era un banc que es dedicava a rentar diners, a blanquejar. Tot això uh, cada vegada més s'està quedant sense fonament. La veritat ha de sortir. Tard o d'hora ha de sortir aquesta veritat. You start with a Finsen note, which is a little butterfly, and on the other side of the world you have a hurricane some months later. And this is what had happened. A little letter with no support, very small, move itself a bit, and on the other side of the Atlantic was a proper hurricane that devastated a bank, families, lawyers, and a lot of people. I, I, I mean, here is not just a, man, a matter of money. I mean, when people are indicted, they are under scrutiny, they have a social problem. Don't forget that Andorra is a very little country. They were highly respected people, and now they're treated like criminals but not only the, the owners and the managers of BPA, but also something very important, the lawyers. And why the, the lawyers are important? Because we are the last line of defense for many people. And if you are criminalized, everybody could be criminalized. And, uh, and at the end of the day, you see families destroyed, credibility is destroyed, uh, a huge cost in defense. Uh, and people who don't know where they will be in a year's time, and this case is already five years going on, and they don't know when it's going to come to an end, which will be the result, because, look, it's very simple. If you shoot somebody, you know more or less which will be the result. But if you haven't shoot anybody, and you are in a process for shooting somebody you didn't shoot, the result could be anything. So the uncertainty is tremendous and the impact on their lives and in their feelings and their families and their kids, because all of them got kids, uh, is tremendous. And this is part of the devastation of a hurricane created with a small butterfly on the other side of the Atlantic. Do you think this will ever be resolved, this BBA case? Do you have anything you want to say? Just to... Well, I, I, I think really you cannot resolve the effects of the hurricane without resolving what has caused it. And that is not here, it's not in Andorra, it's in the US. Remember Jennifer Calvary, the director of FinCEN? 
She not only authorized the Section 311 against BPA, but she is also the one who negotiated HSBC's $1.9 billion fine for laundering money for the Sinaloa drug cartel. Guess where she is today? Jennifer Shalsky Calvary, who is Global Head for Financial Crime Threat Mitigation at HSBC. Remember Jordi Sinka, the blood diamond smuggler who later became Andorra's finance minister, and how he commissioned America's PricewaterhouseCoopers to perform the BPA customer's audit six days after America's Section 311? In September 2019, Mr. Sinka was to be tapped as the new director of an Andorran branch of PricewaterhouseCoopers. But his position was aborted due to a serious reputational problem. However, in January 2020, Jordi Sinka was appointed head of Andorra's Retirement Reserve Fund, Andorra's Social Security Administration, responsible for securing the Andorran citizens their retirement money. While the majority of President Carles Puigdemont's cabinet still sits in a Spanish prison, in January 2020, the European Union, headquartered in Belgium, has granted President Carles Puigdemont a seat at the European Union. Carles Puigdemont began his mandate as MEP in Strasbourg amid great media expectation. Before attending the plenary session, he called on Europe for action and said Catalonia is no longer an internal Spanish affair. So we are here in order to remember and to claim to, uh, to European Union institutions to be involved in a solution based on dialogue. Mr. Gonzalo Boyer is also President Puigdemont's attorney. I interviewed Mr. Boyer in August of 2019 when he proclaimed this statement. Sooner or later, they will try to indict us for whatever, money laundering or whatever. They will invent it and they will try it because at the end, it's not a matter of result. It, um, it's a matter of destroying the person. And eight weeks later, this happened. Anyone with money in the Andorran banking system should consider three problems. The first is that it has a fractional reserve banking system, but no central bank. There's therefore no one to act as lender of last resort. The second problem is that Andorra uses the euro as a currency, but is not in fact a member of either the European Union nor the Eurozone. It therefore has no access to the European Central Bank. And more importantly, it has no method of printing euros in order to provide the banks with liquidity. And finally, it has a third problem, deposit insurance. Andorra has this up to 100,000 euros per account but that lack of a central bank and that lack of a way to print euros means that their insurance isn't really all that much good. Andorra's annual budget is only 470 million euros, while Andorra's banks collectively manage more than 49 billion euros, which is more than 100 times that of Andorra's annual budget. Andorra's annual budget doesn't cover half of what is supposedly frozen in BPA. Sorry. It's okay. No, no, we start again. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Look, you have to to have this money from Andorra because I believe that they are going to disappear. <laughs> yes.